Hello and welcome. Thanks a lot for joining us for this week's panel conversation uh, on how community perspectives impact the delivery of local police services. We've got a great panel today made up of three law enforcement leaders from around the country, and they're going to be sharing what's working for them in terms of engagement with their residents, how they manage those expectations, and, um, and what their expectations are in terms of meeting engagement needs in their, uh, in their communities. I'm really thankful that you're able to join us today. Uh, our hope is that you're going to have the opportunity to uh, learn a little bit about what these communities are doing so that you take away a perspective, a new idea, a new approach that you're going to be able to use in your own organizations. And more importantly, just to have a better appreciation for the work that these communities are doing in serving communities and in building and strengthening public safety um, in their communities. Here's the format of how today's discussion is going to go. I'll first do a quick introduction of our panelists, and then I'll queue up the topic uh, so that we can get into three questions that I'm gonna ask each of the panelists about how they're engaging with their residents. And um, um, at the end of the questioning process, we'll provide an opportunity for any interaction between the panelists or there's something they wanna add or uh, some additional topic they wanna cover. Um, the session generally takes about an hour, and we're just happy that we're able to put this together for your benefit and um, uh, hope that you find value in spending time watching this, uh, watching this session. So let me do some quick introductions. Uh, our first panelist is Chief Robert Johnson, who has served as the police chief in Palo Alto since the beginning of 2018, although he's been in law enforcement since uh, 1986, serving 27 years in Los Angeles. Um, in five years as the chief of police in Menlo Park. Uh, throughout his career, Chief Johnson has focused on community policing philosophies, as well as mindfulness and resiliency training for his department and employees. When he was in Menlo Park, the department was a recipient of the James Q. Wilson Award for Excellence in Community Policing and the IACP Cisco Award for Community Policing. Um, his top priorities in Palo Alto include public safety, traffic and community engagement, uh, he is a very well-recognized professional in the law enforcement world, and I'm really appreciative that he's able to join us for today's conversation. Bob, would you mind just adding a little bit more to your background? No, Matt, I really appreciate the introduction. Uh, yeah, I've been doing this for a little while, and I have to say it's been a journey, uh, but one I've enjoyed from day one, so I'm really happy to be with all of you today. Well, that's great. I'm really excited to hear what's going on in Palo Alto and, and how you are engaging with your community. Our second panelist is Police Chief Mike Tuscan, uh, who was born and raised in Duluth, Minnesota, a great community on Lake Superior, and has served uh, in the Duluth Police Department since 1992, uh, progressing through major responsibilities in the department until becoming the Chief of Police in 2016. Chief Tuscan is passionate about working with the community members to preserve the safety of Duluth by leading the department based on the philosophy of community policing. Uh, during his tenure serving the citizen Duluth, Chief Tuscan has been responsible for developing the CompStat program, working collaboratively on developing an assessment tool to reduce juvenile incarceration rates of children of color and creating a performance management system, as well as developing innovative approaches for engaging his staff in community policing. Uh, Chief Tuscan currently serves on the executive board for the Minnesota Police Chiefs Association and also as an appointee of the Ensuring Police Excellence and Improving Community Relations Advisory Council to the Minnesota Police Officers Standard and Training Board. Um, he's also an adjunct instructor of community policing to students seeking careers in the criminal justice system. Mike, I really appreciate you spending some time and would love for you to share a little bit more about your background. Well, thank you, Matt. I think uh, any time that we have opportunities to have conversations as chiefs, and uh, hear each other's ideas. Let's, uh, let's not kid ourselves. Nobody likes to reinvent the wheel. And I think that uh, this will be a great takeaway for, for each of the chiefs on this panel to uh, hear from each other about innovative ideas that we're doing. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Chief. Um, uh, you've got a lot of great things going on in Duluth as a Minnesota native myself. And uh, so I really appreciate you spending some time with us um, today. Um, let me uh, introduce our third panelist. Joseph Chacon was recently named as the interim chief in the Austin Police Department. In his previous role as assistant chief, he managed the department's central patrol, patrol bureau, which included uh, a very expansive level of responsibilities in the department. And for all of us who traveled to Austin and to enjoy what Austin has to deliver, uh, all the vibrancy and the attractions, 
uh, much appreciation can be given to Chief Chikan for his role in making sure that we were kept safe while he visited Austin. Um, uh, Joseph has been in law enforcement for 28 years and during that time he's been responsible for many critical service areas including patrol functions, special response teams, organized crime, the airport operations. He's a former director of the Austin Regional Intelligence Center whose area of responsibilities encompasses a huge 10 county central Texas area. Uh, Chief Chacon has served on numerous important professional associations and is also committed to being involved in the community in such areas as the Special Olympics and the Miracle League in Austin, which is an adaptive Little League uh, Baseball Association. Uh, Chief Chacon, thank you for joining us and um, would love to hear a little bit more about your background, if you're willing. Oh, yeah, thank you, Matt. And thank you for having me. I'm <clears throat> honored to be here with uh, these colleagues, uh, talk about how we're engaging our community and uh, the different strategies that we might uh, we might be able to share that we found that have been uh, that have been productive and that have been helpful in in building that community trust. So I'm just uh, thank you for for having me on. Yeah, gentlemen, thank you for for being here. I I really do value the time that you spend uh, having these conversations, especially from different segments of the of the country, um, just for the benefit of. Uh, a better understanding about how communities are dealing with engaging with the residents in really this kind of odd time that we're living through. Uh, the topic of the, of the conversation today is putting police needs and expectations into a community context. You know, I was a city manager for over 30 years, mostly in Minnesota, um, but the respect that I developed for law enforcement and the role that law enforcement agencies play in every aspect of community life. I mean, people invest in a community, not only to be safe, but to make sure that their investments are, are, are strong and uh, they get a good return on their money. And it's not just the money, it's their quality of life in all aspects. And law enforcement and um, the role that you play in just helping to build that quality of life, I don't think can be underestimated. Um, uh, uh, and I think in large, in large part, people take for granted the role of law enforcement until something really uh, catastrophic happens or, or that storm happens in the community. And then um, the demands are really high on, on, your, on, your, on your shoulders and in your department. Um, so the respect that I have for the role that you're playing and you know, the impact of making mistakes um, are generational. Communities and the future of communities are really dependent upon law enforcement being done in a manner that is uh, consistent with community values and um, uh, reflective of the things that are going on in the, uh, in the country and in your community. And so these kind of conversations, I think, are really helpful to just have a better understanding and a better appreciation of some of the challenges and the techniques and approaches that you're using for engaging with your residents on those really important strategic things that you're doing. And given the fact that we're in such, we're coming out of COVID, um, we have such a politically divisive environment, um, uh, there's civil unrest that's been happening uh, more frequently than historically. Um, these kind of conversations, I think, can help just provide a better appreciation to the work that you do and the work that your department does in making a community more vibrant and, and stronger. We've done a lot of research around this topic, and um, we have a tool that's called the National Police Services Survey. And the idea or the, the, the goal and the design of the survey is to get a community uh, input uh, and perspectives around uh, law enforcement locally. And we administered this national survey in 2018 and then as well as 2020, kind of pre-George Floyd and post-George Floyd, just to capture what has happened in resident sentiment around police services in the country. And this chart that I'm showing you here is really um, detailing where priorities are uh, and the shift in priorities between the two administrations. And the one thing that I want to point out is that overall, priorities have stayed pretty much in line. School safety and security remains the highest resident priority. Um, but the two areas that actually increased from 2018 and 2020 is that area in increasing communication, increasing connections with the community and um, uh, participating with the police department on more neighborhood planning, uh, working closer with law enforcement agency. And so it's really kind of a reflecting that I think residents are really wanting to have more engagement and more involvement in um, um, the services that they receive from your departments. Uh, we do know that trust in local government has increased over the last couple of years, primarily because local government stepped up to the plate when people were really disrupted and, um, and less certain about their futures. 
And so we know the trust is there. We know that the engagement desire is there. And so the idea is to what, you know, what are you, what are we doing to help develop those engagement connections? And so that people can really appreciate um, that investment on their dollar in their, in their communities and then um, uh, uh, moving forward in their communities. So there are three questions that I really like to pose to each of you. The first one is what role should the community play in guiding or influencing the delivery of local police services? The second is what strategies are you finding successful for managing those community expectations? Um, and then finally, what are the tools and methods that you're finding successful to understanding what those expectations are um, and what their priorities are? And particularly, if you can think about uh, how you are reaching your harder to reach populations, I think that people would love to hear if you've got any ideas or, or suggestions about how to be successful with that. And so um, if you guys are okay, let's just jump into the questions and uh, Chief Johnson, I'd like to stop with you, if you wouldn't mind. Can you talk about um, what role should the community play in guiding or influencing the delivery of police services in Palo Alto? Sure. It's a great question, Matt. You know, one of the things when I came to Palo Alto in 2018, you know, it was all one thing that was already in place is they're, they're a very service oriented organization, as they should be, because Palo Alto is a very... Um, uh, they have a very high expectation of the law enforcement services provided to the community. And I have to say that what benefited me in coming here was my prior experience, both in Los Angeles and Menlo Park. Because one of the things I did in Los Angeles, I was a co-director of the Regional Community Policing Institute. And some of you may remember those institutes, they were throughout the country in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, providing community-oriented policing training to law enforcement agencies. And what I found there in doing that training and being part of that initiative was community engagement is really the foundation to everything we do. And from that point on, the first thing I did when I took command of a, a, a station or a department, I did it in Los Angeles, Menlo Park, and here in Palo Alto is first thing I do is develop a chief's advisory group. And why I do this is I find that this group, which is made up of residents and business owners throughout the city, uh, and they're geographically representing their neighborhoods. And it can be a group in Menlo Park, it was a group of about 13. In Palo Alto, it's a group of about 25. But what that does for me, is gives me the ability to really utilize this group for strategic development. And we've done this in multiple areas in Palo Alto. One of the first things they helped us develop was a strategic traffic plan, which was a very high priority for the community. But we've also used them in other strategy developments, policy considerations, uh, and probably most importantly, over the past 18 months, they've been instrumental as liaisons between the department and the community, and especially when things are controversial. And, and Palo Alto is what I consider a mid-sized agency, and it's a relatively safe, uh, organization, uh, relatively safe city, but we do have our controversial issues. And when those uh, arise, it's really uh, been val valuable to have a community to connect with directly. So that's worked for me, and uh, I'm a big advocate for advisory groups where you can truly connect with the community and have it represented throughout the city. So back to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Chief. Do you, with that advisory group, um, uh, do you have residents and businesses involved in that group? Yeah, so one of the criteria, and it was interesting because uh, when I came to Palo Alto, you know, I put it out there to the community, and the only requirement was you either had to be a resident within the city of Palo Alto, or you had to be a business owner within the city of Palo Alto, and people thought, you know, it was going to be a selection process, but I don't even use boundaries. Whoever applies, I accept. And that's why we ended up with a relatively large group, but they've been engaged. It's the same group now going on uh, approaching four years. They've stayed connected and uh, it's worked really well. And it's a group that I meet with on a monthly basis. You know, being such an active community, I would, I would have to think, but tell me if I'm thinking about this wrong, um, that uh, community engagement is a high priority, not only in your agency, but also in uh, the other city departments. Yeah, it really is. And it's interesting because when I arrived here in 2018, a lot of the things that the city was doing for community engagement had actually been curtailed due to prior budget reductions. So we just got back into it really full speed 
in 2018 in ramping up our citizen academies, our resident academies, offering those twice a year, and really starting to work on building those relationships again. And again, I think all that work really helped us uh, when we had the national unrest. And it's really been beneficial because the conversations have been fast and furious uh, in the last 18 months in a lot of different way, di different areas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. That's a uh, uh, congratulations on the success you're finding with your advisory committee. Thank you, Chief Tuscan. Can I can you talk about the role that um, the community plays in guiding and influencing the delivery of police services in Duluth? Yeah, for certain. Uh, so, you know, uh, we basically start with our social contract theory when we talk about engagement is that um, it is our community members who give us the authority to do the work we do. Um, and that's a, a message that's repeated to me often to our staff is that ultimately the community decides what the priorities are. And with that, that is guided by, of course, community meetings, uh, meeting with people in their places and spaces uh, when they have their most comfort levels. Uh, to give us an appraisal of what we're doing well and what they would like us to focus more upon. Uh, that work stems from community centers and our youth engagement, um, right up to including, uh, we do programs with reading at the library to uh, we were able to secure a pontoon boat to bring uh, our kids from, from uh, uh, many times that are experiencing poverty. Uh, out onto the big lake. Um, we're, we're fortunate to have the largest lake in the world uh, right out our back door. And so uh, we look for creative ways to engage community so that it is uh, not that you're, you're having engagement with a police officer as much as I understand and know officer so-and-so as a friend. And so that's really kind of what we put a lot of effort into, into our youth. And but also, again, the engagement of our community in places and spaces. We run citizens academies as well. Uh, but one of the things that we know from our from COVID for over the last 18 months is that every state did it differently. There wasn't a national response. So depending on what state or what jurisdiction you're in, uh, varying degrees of shutdown happened. And for us um, in, in Minnesota, there was really we went from 100 miles an hour with engagement to really just about nothing and everything was virtual. And I think uh, we were just uh, really have been looking forward to the last few months of getting ramped back up to where we, we were previously with uh, fishing programs and community meetings and opening up our citizens academies and having all that engagement that we had previously done. Chief, did you find or do you have any sense for the levels of involvement or engagement during the last year and a half? Did levels go up at all, even, even if it's virtual? Could you, did you have a sense for that? It, it went, um, for us, it went to uh, almost zero. It went to uh, zero, one, okay. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, with the lockdowns in Minnesota, the way they were, uh, you know, one of the things we really only could do is we were invited to the most birthday parties I've ever seen over the last uh, year, pre-George Floyd. <laughs> uh, we, we went to one party with uh, the fire department and just put on our lights and sirens and waved to the kids and Next thing you know, we were invited to every birthday party. So uh, that was just a way that we could have safe space and have conversations with people out in their yard uh, during birthday parties. But again, it kind of a, a unique way that we found that we could even engage in a pandemic that certainly built those lasting relationships, uh, those impactful relationships that help us with trust uh, moving forward. Yeah, no, I, I, I hear you on the trust factor and that the relationship-based stuff. Do you... Um... Does your department do in, the, in your strategic planning process, does, is community engagement a high priority in that kind of more formal role, even absent the, the, what, the experience of this last year? It is, absolutely. In fact, it's our priority uh, from, from our mission is to build relationships. And we use every, every police call as an opportunity to do engagement. Um, and how we show up is how we will be remembered. Um, you know, one of our core values is that every interaction leaves a lasting impression, and we truly believe that, that uh, we have an opportunity, uh, regardless of what the, brings us there, to have a, uh, a professional response that has integrity and compassion. Yeah, well stated. Yeah, congratulations on, uh, on uh, getting back into the broader engagement world now, <laughs> You're at least working that way. Indeed. <clears throat> Chief Chikan, can you can you talk about the role that the community plays in Austin in guiding 
uh, or influencing police services? Uh, certainly, thank you, Matt. Um, you know, Austin is has a community that's very engaged. Uh, they're paying close attention, uh, not only in the local community, but what's happening across the state and the nation. Uh, as the police reform movement has uh, really come forward in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months. Uh, and then, uh, you know, COVID really complicated all of that when it came to our ability to, to engage with the community and, uh, and the manner in which that was happening. And so many of the efforts that we had in place, we had to put on hold. Uh, they then transitioned to this virtual format that is pretty prevalent now in society. Um, and we continue to do that as COVID is kind of resurging right now. Uh, but what I can tell you is that, you know, we've always uh, placed a high priority in co on community engagement when we uh, defined community policing uh, in our policy manual. It really has, it's centered on community engagement, but for each and every contact that officers have, uh, starting with the 911 call and that comes into our call center and going all the way through the police interaction, we need to be present, visible, engaged. Uh, and we need to be very responsive to that community. Some of the formal efforts that really have uh, come forward in the last uh, 12 months has been around uh, our reimagining public safety effort. Uh, a task force was, uh, was created that uh, analyzed uh, various parts of uh, how the police were doing their work, as well as other social service functions that the city performs in the area of public health, uh, of you know, other services that, that we have to perform for the city, how could we increase some of those uh, to try to affect the overall uh, you know, participation of folks in the criminal justice system? Could we lower that number uh, just as a holistic approach? Uh, the task force has issued a report and we are now working on those recommendations, but I think it's a very good example of how we are looking and taking that public input on uh, on how police services are delivered. And I think, it, you know, to be a 21st century police leader, you need to be responsive to that community and to deliver services in the manner in which they really want them delivered. You've got to be responsive to that. So, um, you know, we continue to work through that, through that process, but it's really, it, it, what it really comes down to is that, are you going to be a police department that is open that is welcoming to the to the community to that engagement, and uh, are you going to show that on each and every contact? Uh, I feel like at Austin Police Department we do that, and uh, you know that's going to continue to be a focus in the future. Yeah, that's great. Um, uh, I'll be interested in kind of taking a look at that task force report and, and seeing what its recommendations are. Was the broader community are they pretty pretty connected to that task force reporting effort? Uh, has there been a lot of opportunities for public engagement around that topic? You know, we always uh, create spaces in which people can go ahead and, um, you know, log in, whether that is sending recommendations via, um, you know, going. Oop, Chief, I think we lost you. That we're all related to uh, gathering input for the task force. Uh, unfortunately, there were, uh, you know, we always want more. We, we can never have enough. And, and we, we continue to try to spark that interest with our, our community in general to make sure that we're getting a, a broad uh, spectrum of, of you know, desires when it comes to public safety, that we're all related to uh, gathering input for the task force. Uh, unfortunately, there were, uh, you know, we always want more, we, we can never have enough. And, and we, we continue to try to spark that interest with our, our community in general to make sure that we're getting a, a broad uh, spectrum of, of you know, desires when it comes to public safety. Uh, you know, it was a more concentrated group, obviously, that worked on, on the task force recommendations themselves. Yeah, well, I mean, congratulations on being proactive on getting that task force in place to being taking a look at the work that you're doing to make sure that it's consistent with the way that your community wants it to be done. And I think that's a really positive step. And, and um, Best of luck as you kind of go through that review process and implementation process. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, let's switch over to the second question. Um, Chief Tuscan, I'd like to start with you on this question. Uh, can you talk about 
the uh, the strategies that Duluth is using for managing community expectations. You know, sometimes people want things to be solved tomorrow, but it's not necessarily possible. And so this question is really oriented around how do you uh, help manage expectations um, on the on the services that you deliver and the, relative to the expectations that the public has. Well, thanks for the question, Matt. Um, I know that uh, Polko um, is certainly helpful in uh, that regard. I wish we used your product yet. And I know that we've talked before about the uh, opportunities that it has. Um, certainly we've had citizen surveys uh, that we've relied upon. Um, and also I think those community meetings are very, very uh, informative for us. We have um, meet with our downtown business uh, groups, our, our business community, certainly our communities to manage expectations. Uh, we also um, are very engaged and have a significant social media presence. While social media cannot always give you a, a, a true temperature of what the community thinks, it certainly is uh, one of the ways in which we really do engage our community. And uh, part of, I think, probably more importantly, isn't necessarily always exactly what the community on any issue can vary but really is more about communicating what our priorities are, I think are very important. And we use every channel to do that. So that I think it helps our community understand we're doing and taking these actions because of these reasons, whether that be uh, speeding through a neighborhood or whether we have an area where it has an uptick in violent crime, uh, we try to be responsive to get the message out about this is why we're taking and using these resources on these problems because they have these outcomes, issues, and are contributing to either safety or not in our community. And so I think it's really a, a two-way conversation. It always works best when it's face-to-face -face and when you're in meetings. Um, and we've had to find a way over the last uh, year and a half to do so virtually uh, more so than, than uh, we would like. I think that face-to-face uh, -face meetings have a tremendous value. That's, you know what, that, um, that really resonates with me a lot. I think, well, congratulations on on uh, all of that work, you know, I think the, the, the point you're making about communicating what your priorities are, um, plus you take that in addition to the relationship building that you place a high priority on and you build that trust factor. It's really just understanding what the issues are and how you're dealing with them that helps people to gain a better appreciation to the services that you provide and, um, uh, and how you deliver those services. So I really appreciate that. And thanks for the plug on Polko. I wasn't, uh, you know, these sessions are not designed for that. We're more than happy to help you out whenever you want. <laughs> but, we'll have to have more conversations, I think, Matt. Thank you. Yeah. Um, um, congratulations on, uh, on what you're doing for helping to manage community expectations. That's great. Chief Chikan, I'd like to ask you the same question. Can you talk about the strategies that you're using in Austin for managing community expectations? You know, uh, I don't think that you can communicate uh, too much uh, with your community about the different efforts that you're that you're doing and and like I, uh, you know just living in Austin uh, we have a community that is very engaged that is paying close attention uh, it gets significant media uh, play on the different efforts that the police department are doing and so uh, all of those things obviously bring a lot of questions that come directly to the police department they might go to their city council members uh, or to other departments that we work with uh, to help understand, you know, how is the department going to accomplish these kind of things? And so um, I think that, you know, our overall strategy really is about uh, connecting with the community early and often, uh, whether we're going through a critical incident and, uh, and there's this, this, uh, you know, this expectation that, that information is going to be shared and, you know, uh, back in June, we had a mass shooting that occurred in the downtown entertainment district here in Austin that uh, I was communicating on a daily basis with the community to make sure that they understood oh, how that investigation was proceeding. Uh, and, you know, it really just comes down to building relationships. Um, if you have uh, those key stakeholders that, um, that are influencers in your community and that you are in regular communication with so that when uh, you are putting forth an effort, or you have that critical incident that happens that you can call to give that early uh, kind of warning, hey, this is something we're getting ready to talk about, they can help to spread the message as well. Uh, through all of that, you're managing the expectations that, um, that people have about how the department is going to put forward an effort or to, to communicate 
Uh, and you, you know, like I said, you can't overstate that uh, the communication is key. Um, Chief, can you talk a little bit about um, uh, how you staffed your communication department or your, your communication function uh, or any suggestions? I mean, given you know, the mass shooting that you went through, any suggestions in terms of managing expectations from a communicate, a kind of a formal departmental communication function? Any, any suggestions or recommendations? Yeah, certainly. I think it, you know, it, it all comes down to what kind of resources does your department have? And, you know, uh, many departments are really resource strapped or resource poor and, and it's tougher. You know, in Austin, uh, we're blessed to have a dedicated public information office. So I'll, I have a public information manager that I work with that helps to manage that messaging. And she is part of the larger, uh, you know, city public information office uh, that helps to make sure that we've got all of the stakeholders from the city's perspective, including our city manager's office, kind of plugged in. And, and you know, everybody's kind of taking a, uh, taking a look at the message uh, for, for, you know, police leaders. It's so important, you know, obviously, uh, whether you work for a strong mayor, a former government, or you've got a, you know, a council manager, former government, you've got to talk to your boss and make sure that they know the message that you're putting out there uh, so that the messaging is consistent. It's kind of been vetted. Uh, it's accurate, um, and that, that's another thing, you, you know, just the accuracy of the information that you're putting out, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, you're, you're putting out information that later on turns out to be incorrect, you, and you have to walk it back a little bit. Managing expectations when it comes to the early information that you have in critical incidents is pretty critical to, to just kind of state, this is the information we have right now, and this may change based on the investigation and that type of thing. Uh, you know, helps to set expectations. Yeah, thank you for clarifying that. And I think that a lot of times, I think residents don't really appreciate um, not only the critical nature of being responsive, uh, especially in emergency situations like you recently had in June, but the, the interdepartmental coordination that's necessary from citywide communications to public works, uh, incident command work, or, or um, uh, those kinds of things that impact and involve all of the different departments. And so that I'm glad you brought up that interconnectivity and on the communication realm with other departments so that you're working as an organization and not just the department. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. Chief Johnson, can you talk about the strategies that you're using in Palo Alto for helping to manage community or community expectations? Yeah, Matt, I, I got to say, this is another great question. Because I have to be honest, I think you know managing community expectations, especially over the past 18 months, has probably been uh, an extreme challenge for agencies across the country. I know it has been for Palo Alto, and I say that based on a couple of things. You know, we were confronted with the unexpected, right? It started with the pandemic, and then for many uh, organizations, and it definitely applied in Palo Alto, that led to economic instability. Uh, and then we had some budget reductions, and then we had the national unrest, and then the demand for police reform. And at the same time, we didn't have what we normally do, that ability to engage with our community front and center, face to face. And I think that really made it challenging. And one of the things we were able to do in Palo Alto, fortunately, is adapt fairly quickly to social media platforms, but there are multiple platforms, so it's tough to figure out who's following what and how to get the message out. But we were also able to utilize you know, Microsoft Teams as well as Zoom, uh, fortunately, to really start to host our community forums and get the conversation uh, moving forward. And we were able to do that throughout the summer. And from those conversations, we were able to respond to the community by developing our website a little more and really putting things that the community wanted on there. For example, our race and equity page uh, is now a part of our website that keeps the community informed on really our efforts around police reform and accountability. We also have a page that connects our residents to all the accountability measures that we have in place for Palo Alto. You know, whether it's our body camera uh, program, our police auditor, or our use of force protocols. And that's helped to inform the community. And unless they had gone through one of our academies, a vast majority of the communities just doesn't have that information readily available. So that's helped uh, educate and inform our community and that's worked well for us. And as you know, Matt, uh, on a national level, there's been a big push for finding uh, alternative models to how we respond to certain calls, especially around the area of mental health. And again, I feel we've been uh, fortunate to be able to start going into that co-response model 
that we'll have in our community soon, meaning that we'll have an officer and a mental health clinician partnered up responding to calls. Um, that's something that'll be new for Palo Alto, but it's just another layer of protection that we'll have and resource that we'll have for our community. So I really think that staying engaged as best you can can help because I do see, you know, especially as we're starting to come out of the pandemic, well, I say that, but then we're starting to go back into some of those same restrictions, especially here in California. I think having that open line of communication with the residents in whatever platform you can is only gonna benefit you. And that willingness to continually be engaged in finding solutions, because we're not gonna be able to do everything they ask. It's just not possible with the resources that we currently have, but at least being willing to listen and engaged in finding solutions in California, one of those conversations is around radio encryption, as you may know. Uh, our Department of Justice has sent out a mandate that all police communication be um, encrypted or you have a policy in place that uh, protects the privacy information of the residents we serve. So that's caused a lot of uh, conversations and dialogue recently, but we're always working to find the solution and, and I have no doubt we will in time. So. That's kind of so a few things that we're doing here in Palo Alto, and it's been working pretty well for us so far. You know, uh, thanks for bringing that up. You know, in the work that we do, we find that one of the greatest ways you can engage and build engagement is if you follow through and demonstrate or make sure that those folks who are engaging have a good understanding as to what you do with that engagement. And um, so you have just shared a little bit about how you have provided solutions by adapting your website based on the expectations and the input that you receive. So it's really kind of that follow through that you have done that I think also helps to build those relationships. Has that, is that resonate with you at all? Yeah, no, absolutely. And even, you know, again, the value of my advisory group and checking back with them on a monthly basis, you know, they're kind of the sounding board for me to tell me, hey, that was good. This is working. We still want to maybe look at modifying this or that. And a lot of the conversation has been about our policies and, you know, our policies are available online, but we've made a lot of adjustments to our policies, just like I, I'm assuming a lot of other agencies out there, especially around the use of force or canine deployments. Um, but it gives the community the ability to actually go on and see when we put those policy updates. Uh, when we do them on a quarterly basis, we notify the community what policies we've modified, updated, so they can go to our website and, and read it for themselves. So, yes, I do think it's been beneficial for us. Yeah, that's outstanding. Congratulations on, uh, on all of that that you're doing. Let's go to the third question. Um, Chief Chikana, I'd like to start with you on this question. Can you talk about the tools and methods that you're using to understand what resident expectations are, uh, what their priorities are, and, um, and how you track your performance? Uh, certainly. So I think that if you're going to to be responsive, you got it. You have to provide those outlets for the community to, to provide that kind of input, and, and we we do it in a number of different ways. Um, you know, the our, probably our preeminent program is our district representative program. Some dedicated uh, community police function officers that are the uh, the conduit to um, to directly connect with police uh, by the public. So each uh, sector in our city is assigned to one of these district representatives and, um, and through our website, people can find the name and number for a particular officer that then becomes their officer. They have issues, they have questions, they're able to reach out directly to that person and get a very uh, you know, responsive um, uh, response from them. Uh, you know, of course, we're using social media. Uh, we have a number of different platforms. Uh, our biggest one's probably being Twitter and Nextdoor. Uh, but also have a, you know, a, a presence on Facebook and some others as well uh, to be able to gather some input. Um, there's a number of boards and commissions that people can uh, become a part of for more formally as part of the city uh, to, uh, to be able to provide some feedback <clears throat> or direction in the area of public safety. Um, you know, as we're going through our own reimagining public safety effort, the task force uh, that was set up and that people had an opportunity to participate in uh, was another kind of formal uh, thing, you know, and then, uh, you know, we're really trying to reach out to some of our, uh, you know, more marginalized communities as well, and it's particularly those that have um, less access because of language barriers. 
So we, uh, the city has a language access program and we are, uh, you know, publishing documents and having conversations with folks in uh, other languages, uh, especially, uh, you know, in Spanish and some of our Asian languages, uh, as well as sign language. So um, all of those things are to help increase that communication, the access uh, and the ability to, to do that um, ha has been very helpful. Yeah, that's a broad-based approach, uh, very wide, wide, broad-based. <clears throat> do you have any suggestions to um, other police chiefs that are trying to figure out how to connect with those harder-to-reach populations? Anything that, that you would recommend that they really pay attention to? You know, you really, you really got to look at the demographics of your uh, area of responsibility <clears throat> and, and figure out where you're going to get the best uh, kind of bang for your buck. Um, you know, for us, uh, certainly looking at our our population that speaks Spanish is, is the number one, you know, other than English uh, language that is spoken in Austin. Uh, Vietnamese is also up there. And, uh, and, then, and then bringing people on board that can help uh, to translate documents that can be that point of contact. Uh, look at from that language access perspective, are you able to post signs uh, in your police facilities that uh, people would be able to point to and say, that's my language, can I get somebody that can, that can translate that way? Uh, those are something that we have in our facilities is they're starting to reopen now that we are uh, coming out of COVID, uh, that we um, try to make that connection. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you know, it strikes me that law enforcement agencies are being impacted so much by just kind of community noise uh, which isn't really demonstrating the truth or explaining the truth or describing what is actually happening. I'm kind of curious, do you have um, a metric system set up that can actually track your performance over time? So you've got that longitudinal data that's based upon objective criteria that can help guide decisions in your department? You know, we have a, a pretty robust uh, crime analysis uh, division that is headed up and, and we actually uh, for the first time ever in our in our department uh, history, hired a chief data officer to uh, somebody with that educational background, uh, and that is able to uh, to to bring that perspective from uh, really looking at the metrics. Um, for a long time, I think that you know much of the data has not you know or the decisions that that a uh, that an agency is making have not been as evidence based and intelligence led as we would like for them to be. And so I think that is uh, the way of the future. I think you know there has to be significant investment in uh, in finding those kind of resources so that you are making those good decisions. And importantly, you know, especially with your decision makers, you can back them up with data. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I, uh, very very well stated. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, for that response. Really appreciate it. Chief Johnson, can you talk about the tools and? methods that you're finding successful in, in helping you to understand what residents are expecting, where the priorities are, and in tracking your performance? Sure, Matt. You know, one of the things I, I have to say, and I found it in uh, all three organizations that I've worked for over the years, whether it was uh, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, Menlo Park Police Department, and now Palo Alto Police Department, is that we sometimes fall into the trap of directing our resources to where we think they should be rather than asking the community what they want and what is truly important to them. And one of the things that I found in the pre-pandemic era of policing is that what was used to, used to be really beneficial and I had taken part of would be community town hall meetings specifically designed to create a visioning process of what the community expects and then to set those priorities from that meeting. We did this in Menlo Park, in fact, and the outcome was closing a neighborhood substation in one of the neighborhoods where it was run down and really not used to its uh, capability. But the outcome led to the uh, creation and the building of a new community service center that was represented of that neighborhood. And in Palo Alto, we've done the same thing or did the same thing. And it led to the reinstatement of a dedicated traffic team and the development of that traffic, uh, strategic traffic plan that was designed actually by the residents one of the other things that I, I really am an advocate for, and I know you asked, said that we didn't have to put a plug in, but is community surveys uh, to measure whether we're meeting those expectations. And we, in fact, Palo Alto just received the results of our annual survey conducted by Polco and realized that we actually have to reevaluate some of the operational directives that we have in place in order to better serve the community. 
I'm really looking forward to the time when we can re-engage face-to-face and hold those visioning processes again, because a lot has changed over the past, you know, really two years. And I think the priorities will adjust. Fortunately, one of the things that's benefited us in Palo Alto is we did, we're able to take advantage of some of the technology available and we're able to engage the residents over the past uh, year and a lot of the ad hoc community or uh, council ad hoc committee meetings that were formed and the political um, um, conversations that needed to be had. So we had the residents pretty well engaged throughout this process and that's helped. But again, I think the survey after we've done all that we've done would be beneficial to see is did we meet the needs and the expectations of the community? Because one of the things that I think we all know is that we can have community engagement, but not necessarily do anything with that information. But when you have it, and then you set the priorities, and then you develop the plan, and you implement the plan, then you reassess the plan and revise the plan, it just leads to a better better uh, relationship overall, in my opinion. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I think, um, I mean, Palo Alto has been such a, a data-driven agency for such a long time that you've got the benefit of that information over time. Do you find that that engagement um, uh, and the survey work that you do helps to inform decisions in your strategic goals and your strategic direction? Yeah, I, I do. In Palo Alto, for years, in fact, the city of Palo Alto has conducted annual surveys um, with the community but they're kind of broad. And actually I really, the conversation we're presently having is making it more specific to each department and taking a deeper dive in uh, to, rather than the general question, do you feel safe at night? Do you feel safe in your community? Uh, are they providing the service? You know, really dialing it down almost to that visioning process uh, uh, level to where you're asking very specific questions and really trying to dial in what they're asking us to do, because there's been so many different things in the past year that the communities are asking law enforcement to do. And again, it goes back to having the resources. You have to find uh, what you can do with what you have uh, to the best of our ability. Yeah, and you know, that, that information provides you also the ability to align your resources maybe in a yes. different way than you historically have relied on. So um, uh, very helpful, thank you. And I. And uh, I'm kind of curious with your citizen academies, you've got a great alumni club now for, for helping guide your, your operations as well, I suspect. Yeah, they, you know, that's really turn, it's everybody that has them knows the value of that. Not only are you informing and educating your community on how we operate and how we serve, but the relationships that are built out of that can be lifelong and they can definitely become great liaisons. And sometimes you even find it a great recruiting um, source oh, yeah. because people find an interest, they come and we're finding a younger and younger generation coming to our academies, finding interest in what we do. And therefore we've had people actually turn around and apply to the police department as a result of that. So a lot yeah. of benefits to those academies. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Um, really appreciate your, your, uh, your responses on all of the questions. So thank you. You're Chief Tuscan, can you talk about the tools and methods that you're finding successful in Duluth for helping you to understand what resident expectations are and, and how you track your performance? Absolutely, thanks Matt. Uh, so we started off when I was uh, first became chief uh, having a strategic planning process, uh, followed up uh, more recently a couple of years ago with the organizational assessment. Uh, those two documents had uh, were created as a result of uh, citizen surveys, uh, also uh, more than 50 uh, focus groups. Uh, and so we found that really uh, is, is important surveys are having those focus groups and those meetings to really understand exactly what it is our community wanted to see in their police department was very, very helpful. In addition, of course, um, I think it's important, you know, the resources you do have. Um, we have, when I hear, uh, you know, PIOs, we have a PIO, a single PIO that key, we keep quite uh, quite busy and using social media platforms to, again, the uh, part of communication has got to be two ways. And uh, many times we get information, but we're not always great as uh, police departments about telling people what we did with that information and how we 
communicate to communities said you ask for and this is what we delivered is often the greatest failings of police departments is we don't ever really feel we're circling back and closing that loop of communication about here's what your your concerns were in your neighborhood here's the, all the things that we did here's all the hours of of, of uh, patrol work or here's the community engagement that we did and these are the outcomes and so i think it's always very important and probably one of the greatest challenges we have is in engaging our community to understand what we did with that information they gave. Now, we also have a citizen review board uh, in Duluth that is very helpful for us. Uh, part their, their primary function is to uh, review police complaints, but they also have engaged the community in building policies as well in our department. In this time, um, post George Floyd, I think that has been remarkably important for us that uh, community members can go to the citizen review board meetings and have a voice to be heard about how they wanna change policy or procedure. We also have uh, relationships and, and regular meetings with our NAACP. As we're reimagining policing, uh, many of these ideas are coming from uh, community stakeholders as well. And so there's just a number of different ways in which we're trying to engage our community to better understand what their priorities are, but also to be communicative about how we are addressing those needs. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm, I'm glad I, I meant to ask you um, how you had structured your communication staff uh, internally and uh, on, on the, one of the earlier questions. And so I'm glad that you brought up the, the fact that you have a PIO that helps manage those communication strategies, but it also recognizes that, that you have a person to help you manage communications in a very big community and a very big department. Um, kind of gets back to that whole management of uh, community expectations and being able to communicate it in a way that, um, that helps residents appreciate the work that is being done. So I, I totally appreciate that. And you know, you're playing such an important role now with the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association, particularly in Minnesota and all of those demands on trying to help communities identify and develop those ways to cut through that community noise so that residents across the state in whatever community they're in gets a really good feeling or a good understanding, a true understanding about what's going on in their relative departments. Um, anything that you wanna share about what's going on at the association level at all? It's a, it's a little bit beyond the city of Duluth, but um, any actions that the board has taken that you wanna share? Yeah, you know, so as with George Floyd happening in Minnesota, you know, we were really ground zero for a lot of the changes in Minnesota here to, to reimagine policing. And so we're doing everything from uh, looking about co-responders uh, models, um, which we've been fortunate to have here at DPD uh, since 2014, but also uh, most recently with legislative sessions about how do we have our dispatchers who are initially taking calls start to sort through calls where perhaps um, mental illness or people uh, who are suffering from substance abuse are calling and what does that response look like right from 911 call? How do we start to engage um, what we say and how we communicate to people over the phone uh, to how do we uh, get the right resources responding? Because we know that that makes all the difference to have the right people in the right places to make the right decisions will change outcomes in our communities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for, for adding that and sharing that. Uh, Chief Chacon, I know we're going to lose you in a, another second or two. Um, this is be a good time if you have any follow-up questions or issues that any of you want to bring up, um, uh, now would be the time to do that. Um, but if not, I want to uh, I want to be able to be respectful of your time. Um, uh, um, thank you all for joining us. And um, Chief Cohen, please, you have to drop off. Thank you very much for being part of this conversation. <clears throat> It has been a great panel. You've all shared really, uh, really innovative, great ways to be involved in, uh, in engagement. I love the way that you have engaged your communities and have been proactive in the way that you're connecting with your residents formally through task force or, or uh, 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 with doing special reporting or special analysis or um, uh, Bob, the work that you're doing with your chief task force. Uh, all of you are doing just super stuff. You all recognize the impact that the virtual world has had on your operations, uh, which has come at the cost of being able to have those direct relationships, which, which are so important in the work that you're doing. Um, 
but you've all kind of resonated around this notion of and the importance of uh, creating trust and the way you do that is you communicate early and you communicate often and you communicate consistently um, with your residents and then you follow through with letting them know how those engagement efforts and activities have helped kind of guide decision making in your departments. Um, this has been super. I just, I really appreciate the, the, uh, the perspectives and the ideas and the solutions that you've all shared. Um, let me just kind of wrap this up though. Uh, I will follow up and make sure that you've got contact information with the other panelists or about the other panelists so that you can connect if you want to them. Um, I do these sessions every week. And so I would welcome you to share names with me of anybody that you think would be good and would find value in having these kind of conversations. We will package these up and over the next week, around a week, you'll start seeing them being published on LinkedIn. And we ask you to share them with your networks too. There's a lot of people that respect your opinions and uh, will we'll, we'll find value in uh, the, the thoughts and ideas that you've shared today. Um, and I'll certainly be connecting. I'd love to get some feedback from you on how the session went and how it served you in terms of uh, spending an hour um, sharing what you're doing in your communities. I really love having these conversations because you get the value of meeting great folks, great leaders in law enforcement. Uh, the work that you do is so critical and um, uh, just really appreciate the time and, and uh, the opportunity to get to meet you a little bit better. 